Marcel. Also, very specially recognized Professor J.O. Igene. Professor Igene, you are welcome, sir. Thank you. 
From 1985 to 1990, he was chairperson of the advisory group, World Health Organization Collaborative Sector for International Drug Monitoring, Uppsala, Sweden. Eventually, from 1990 to 2009, Professor Ralph Edwards was a professor in medicine and CEO and director of the World Health Foundation Center for International Drug Monitoring, Oxford Monitoring Center, UMC. Mr. Vice Chancellor and Pro Chancellor of Service, Professor Edwards has made profound contributions to the development and advancement of the field of medicine, safety, pharmacovigilance in new scientific discipline. In his position as professor in medicine and CEO and director of WHO Foundation Center for International Drug Monitoring, he brought to bear his scientific prowess with the development of systems and technologies to manage the global data generated by the enormous diverse drug reaction reports to the UNC. And in the last 20 years, his research has focused on the identification and confirmation of ADRs using data mining in big data and in Australian healthcare records, drug benefit risk analysis, good communications practice on drug benefits and risk. This has engaged in retirement, definitely not tired, since 2009 as Senior Medical Advisor to the UNC and the WHO Program for International Drug Monitoring. He has, to his credit, over 200 publications in peer review journals. <laughs> he has also served as editor to peer review journals, and Professor Edwards offered his services and expertise as external examiner in clinical pharmacology and or toxicology in universities of Zimbabwe, Cape Town, University of Hartfield, UK, expert witness in legal actions relating to human adverse effects of drugs and clinicians in different parts of the world. Professor Edwards is the foundation past president of the International Society of Pharmacovigilance and has served as a member of several World Health Organization expert advisory panels, as well as the United Advisory Group. This friend of Africa and Africans, with an initial stint in Zimbabwe, did not leave Africa out of the safety net ensuring safe and effective use of medicine. As we have said, details will be given on Saturday. Mr. Chairman, sir, is this eminent personality that are now invited to deliver the 45th Convocation Lecture of the University of Benin. <laughs> Professor Ra Ivo Ero Shah. Trying to do their exams to become graduating students, I gather. 
uh, you prob probably your latest major experience is of being successful in mastering courses in various disciplines at a very high level, at a high ranking university. My heartiest congratulations to all of you who are in that position. I want to build onto the excitement of your achievements and the start of your new life. It will be a life in which you will take responsibilities for using your knowledge and skills in the world out there. This talk will focus on aspects of being a professional, individual, in society and in the world today. Use some medical examples of the professional life that you've heard something about. My first message, everyone has challenging and even bad times. I urge you to embrace the bad experiences because they will help you appreciate the good things more by contrast. And you will always learn more as you conquer adversity than you learn when all is comfortable and good. Be hopeful cynics like me. Hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. You may have heard of Spike Milligan, the comedian, who had engraved on his tombstone, I told you I was sick. How I came here to they need. I'll share with you some of my background. I'll give you some examples of personal challenges and what I have learned from them, with outcomes that had effects on people in Nigeria, Africa, and the whole world. My first real awareness in of Nigeria was meeting with Pro Professor Latif Salako when I was a very junior person in the Department of Foreign College in the University of Sheffield. He'd been a research fellow in Sheffield in the 1960s and was revisiting in 73, just after he was appointed as professor of clinical pharmacology at Ipadan University. He was befittingly given an honorary doctorate by a Sheffield University in 1994. I was a University of Birmingham student. That university had many connections with the University of Zimbabwe. And I had several African friends at medical school because of those influences. But my career led me first to the University of Sheffield, where I had held a deanship and a lectureship, then to the new University of Leicester, where I was a senior lecturer and senior tutor, as you've heard. And from there, to the Chair of Medicine at the University of Zimbabwe. When I first became interested in human toxicology, whilst there, I was surprised at the number of serious adverse effects I saw from medicines and from poisonings, from organophosphate to pesticides, thallium, methanol, snake bites, and some other toxins. I am proud that a patient I treated after a bite from a large kaboom fiber was the first documented survivor. <laughs> I, I also experimentally and successfully used the insulin potassium dextrose treatment for terminal congestive cardiac failure in about a dozen patients who were thought not to survive more than a month. Patients were better within a week and remained, remained so for up to six months after a single treatment from this kind. <laughs> from there, I moved to New Zealand to the position of director of the National Toxicology Group, which was responsible for matters relating to the toxicity of all medicines and chemicals. An extremely interesting and challenging job. I dealt with everything from outbreaks of poisonings in schools, caused, one caused by a pupil convincing others that blue copper sulfate crystals were sweets for cannabis. Another uh, uh, was due to a chlorine gas inhalation experience in a chemistry uh, 
laboratory that went wrong. The teacher went out and uh, the uh, students uh, inhaled thinking that it was, uh, would give them new experiences. Maybe it did give them a very bad experience. And there was another incredible and difficult investigation of supposed deaths of Fijians who were thought to have eaten crocodile meat contaminated by chemicals which had leaked from a cargo ship. For each of these experiences and appointments around the world, I developed a very wide experience of life in general. Finally, I specialised in pharmacovigilance, the diagnosis and treatment and prevention of problems from medicines used in clinical practice. I moved to Sweden to the WHO Centre for International Drug Monitoring, the, the Uppsala Monitoring Centre, UMC. I was director of this international work, its database, technical services and research for 19 years. There are now believe it or not, over 20 million reports in that international database of suspected adverse effects of uh, medicines on individuals. And those come now from 130 countries worldwide. When I started there in 1990, there were only 20 countries involved in the program. So now we, that uh, program covers nearly the whole world. <laughs> the discipline of pharmacovigilance started in the 1960s after a widely used sedative medicine, thalidomide, was found to cause failure in development of the, the arms and legs of newborns whose mothers had taken the drug early, the medicine early in pregnancy. Those children had hands and feet growing directly from their bodies. And they were said to look like seals or penguins, which translated to funcomelia in Latin. And that's what the condition is called. A dreadful time. More thousands of children had the problem in uh, Northern Europe. A generation on, we know of lots and lots more and different problems. The unfortunate people who have adverse reactions to medicines have been in my professional life now for nearly 40 years. Very few people, however, know anyone who has had a serious effect from taking Yet in several studies in different world populations, the total burden of adverse effects from medicine treatments forms between one third and the fifth most common cause of death in and more serious hospital admissions. Can you believe that? How does it happen when so when very many people seem to have seen so few with uh, a problem of this sort. Most people we know who take painkillers, oral contraceptives, antibiotics, other common medicines, or who are vaccinated, have good outcomes of their treatment. Well, there are nearly 20,000 active pharmaceutical ingredients around worldwide, and hundreds of thousands of products that have contained, contained them. According to the United Nations, about 275 million people worldwide, 5.6% 5 5 of the global population, aged 15 to 64 years, used medicines at least once during 2016. Some 31 million of people who use medicines suffer from medicines use disorders, meaning that their medicine use is harmful to the point where they may need treatment. It's this huge amount of medicines use that makes this problem so large and so important. On top of these known figures are those people who have used drugs. 
We have very poor statistics on it. What we use are people's medicines. Very common in small communities that borrow from each other. Not a sensible thing to do, no. And, and those many people in countries where controls and statistics on the use of medicines are unreliable, including many African countries. In many resource limited settings, medicines are, not, are on open sale and are not controlled at all. Globally, the reporting of adverse effects from medicines is poor. Not greater than 5% of people's problems with medicine are reported to the monitoring systems in their countries and then get into the WHO's database. We're missing a huge amount of problem when we consider the available statistics only. More experience in Nigeria. I met Professor Amrozisa soon after I went to the UMC in 1990. Professor Issa was the instigator of foreign commitments in Nigeria. He has, a, he has acquired a modest person and a, has been a close colleague to me ever since. That was where I was. <laughs> he is known internationally, amongst other things, as being the first to propose international standards for national pharmacovigilance centers' performance. And these have become used and copied worldwide. <laughs> he has on many occasions provided advice to the WHO on specific medicine safety issues and has been on the uh, uh, advisory committee. He has developed research in pharmacovigilance. And I had the pleasure of being one of three assessors of a recent PhD thesis of one of his students, which was a cooperative study with major hospitals and med medical schools in Nigeria. And it was acclaimed by all three external examiners as being the highest international standard. <laughs> I also knew, rather sadly, the late Professor Dora Akinina, who had a quite different personality. She was an extrovert and very active in public debates and politics. Many of you will know the name because of her many public announcements. She was a recognized figure in Nigeria because she was the head of the NAFTA, which was a regulatory agency. She was known throughout the world. Because she did so much for eradicating the corruption and scourge of fraudulent and low standard medicines in Nigeria, along with the, alongside the development of pharmacovigilance. She was nearly assassinated for her trouble and was forced to have protection against unscrupulous people who wanted to stop her good work against fraud. Her early death was made more poignant by her last public speech, which she concluded by saying, Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates, I leave you with the words of this Greek proverb, a society grows great when old men plant trees, whose shade, shade they know they shall never sit in. Dora, that was you. I've had the good fortune to work with the, both of these friends for medicine safety and to be present in Abuja when Nigeria gained entry to the WHO program for international drug monitoring in September 2004. It was the 74th member, full member of the program. The three of us professional individuals coming together by accident have been able to improve, to improve the safety of medical treatment in Nigeria and the world, although there's much more to be done. We needed each other's complementary personalities and skills to move the issues of improving safer medical treatment in Nigeria and 
uh, professor had the essential vision and academic status to develop the science and to teach the clinical skills of pharmacovigilance. Professor Adeniu was the person with political, rhetorical and communication skills. She used them to great advantage, taking from the vast clinical wisdom of colleagues, including more recently those experiences of Professor Emmanuel Akura at the Loyal University. And they all used the global experiences and data that I was able to provide via my dedicated colleagues in Sweden. Individuals with good critical thinking and determination coming together can make a big difference. This is my second message. Some of my challenging professional experiences. Up to 15 to 20 percent of African people lack an enzyme called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, G6PD, which protects the red blood cells from being destroyed in certain circumstances. For instance, in, in the most severe deficiency, people who eat favor beans, barber beans, uh, can die of acute anemia because they lack that GC6 PD protection. Dapsone is a drug which is a component of the medicine malaprop, and that's a fictional name, and you'll see why in a minute, and damages red blood cells like fire beans. We knew that malaprop might be dangerous then, even at low doses. The WHO, in collaboration with the pharmaceutical company ABC, not its real name again, conducted two studies under the direction of the Kenyan Medical Research Council in children, which showed how effective the medicine was. But they neither measured G6PD in any of the trial subjects nor did they check what happened to any of the children who did not return for follow-up assessments. These studies were reported in the Lancet Journal, stating they had an ethical approval. I thought that the trials completely failed to address the risks of this toxic medicine. I raised my concerns about safety at the WHO Advisory Committee on the Safety of Medicinal Products, which agreed. A report from this meeting, however, was ignored. There was no response at all from the WHO. What was I to do? Was I to stay silent? I persisted with some more sympathetic colleagues in the WHO that there was a risk to many people in Africa and the trials were flawed. The result was that an ad hoc committee of relevant experts was eventually set up in 2004, of which I was supposed to be the chairperson. But the WHO ABC Development Committee reluctantly agreed to this new expert committee, but referred, refused my chairmanship on the grounds of conflict of interest. It was my conflict of interest that I was concerned about safety. The development team argued that some advice on the safe use of Malakoff would be adequate and would be given when the medicine was released. But it was clear to all of us on the ad hoc committee that the level of monitoring of patients proposed in this advice before and after and while using Malakoff was impractical in very many very African settings in rural areas. In any case, WHO would not allow our report to be released for about 18 months after the committee first left. Met. And then they wanted many changes to the document that uh, the committee had agreed on. Two years after the ad hoc committee first met, Malaprop was released, as I said, in 2004. So it was actually released 
at the same time as the uh, safety committee's evidence was made public. It felt unlikely uh, in this long period when they were making changes in government that this new report would be ever published. And I decided, in spite of the meeting participants being subject to confidentiality agreements, I could not let this delay and dilution of the experts and committee's views on the report thus. In spite of probable serious repercussions like uh, for me, I uh, released the information to a freelance reporter I knew. The story was published and uh, went into a well-known weekend paper in the UK. I felt I was a coward. But the change report was published, which was my main aim. Malaprop was used in 17 African countries. There were several deaths, many seriously ill patients that were G6 PD deficient, and Malaprop was withdrawn from the global market in 2009. Four years too late. Which is 
not only a, a pharmaceutical company, but regrettably included WHO, who made changes after it. And uh, problems of confidentiality versus transparency. And finally, of course, how minority groups are poorly considered and are harmed. My third message is don't trust anything that anyone says at its face value. Not even me. Be alert and critical. Also, be a hopeful cynic. Hope for the best, but prepare the worst. With the issues of conflicts and ethics raised, I would like to expand a little further. Politics and public health does not usually involve decisions about individual people but does decide where money should be spent by healthcare services in every country. So a decision may come up, and this has happened in practice, about whether one should spend money on vaccination or developing transplants operations in a country. The public health physicians always favor vaccination because so much illness and death can be prevented. But of course you may have a different view if you're 30 and need a kidney transplant. The public health ethic cannot be denied, but it places the majority good, good first, even though those decisions may indirectly harm individuals. In the case of medical practitioners, the our ethics is of putting one's patient first, as enshrined in the Hippocratic Oath and subsequent declarations of health safety. A physician shall act in the patient's best interest when providing medical care. Both ethical views are valid and can only be resolved by real thinking, deep thinking. And trying to understand both sides. And then a satisfactory compromise can be Empathy is when I try to use everything I know about another person or situation from their perspective, experiences, and feelings. In the development of Maraprop, the WHO ABC development group was only concerned about effectiveness and not safety at all. And this leads me on to the related topic of conflict of interest. This is usually taken as meaning that a person may be subject to influences that affect and bias their views when making critical decisions. Almost every area in life in which decisions are made it involves conflicts of interest. How do we decide what may be relevant? Most people are aware of the need to declare an economic conflict of interest. But there is a secondary question. What level does the offer of money or a present infer a conflict of interest? Is someone going to be biased if they are bought by a pint of beer by a friend? The, the FDA Food Drug Administration in the States actually thinks so, and their employees are banned from taking anything like that. But it might be a free holiday, or even being given free access to a useful website that you could use very well for your purposes, and, being a, and it would be important a important benefit. And then what about declaring non-material which I have recently called philosophical bias. In dealing with patients, for example, clinicians are bound to be influenced by their feelings towards patients in a multitude of ways. So William Trithbaum, an eminent psychiatrist and my tutor at one time, argued that from the first moment a doctor sees a patient, they should decide whether they like that patient. Sounds a bit crazy at first thought, but 
as he pointed out, those feelings will affect the clinical advice and decisions any, so to that point of any patient. And then I'm going to ask you, what about love? But you may think that's something a little odd in this context. At one WHO meeting, I was arguing that the SSRI antidepressants had problems with some dependence and certainly caused severe withdrawal symptoms, meaning and therefore needed more warnings. The chairman of the meeting stopped the discussion for an early coffee break. And with tears in his eyes, he took me aside and said, my wife is taking SSRIs. She would be so scared if she was classed as a drug addict and may discontinue these important drugs. He would not allow the discussion on SSRIs to continue, but without any explanation. Was it not ethical to declare this conflict of interest? I certainly think it's wrong not to be transparent about issues like this, even though you can have every uh, feeling for this poor guy and his wife. Message four is try to be, to, to be sure you understand all the evidence and any biases, ramifications and conflicts before making a final decision. If you really have to make an early decision on poor evidence, make sure to follow up to see that you've made the right decision. I once walked behind a beautiful person wearing jeans with one back pocket embroidered with the answers maybe and on the other pocket and that's final. A further look at what is normal, the norm, and what about outliers and individual, outlying individuals. So far, I focused on the child challenges that face me, a professional who's been luckier than the average in the population. I think the behavior of the privileged should be guided by the French expression, noblesse oblige, privilege carries responsibilities. And I've tried to follow that advice. But now I want to turn to those who are on the disadvantaged side of the norm. A dictionary synonym to disadvantaged is excluded, and that is often what happens. In epidemiology, extremes of people on both sides of the average or norm are excluded and called outliers. There is good reasoning behind the epidemiological norm, which is namely there to find results that fit most people. The first essay I ever wrote at university dealt with normality, and I questioned what outliers mean. Who do outliers represent? What are the consequences for them? What becomes of those outlying people and their needs? In this context, I also point, pointed to the difference between the plight of those that might be considered subnormal to those that are supernormal, the privilege. Let me give you an example. I was concerned about the rollout of WHO's 3x5 program in 2003 to provide AIDS treatment to 3 million people in Africa by 2005. It was a very deserving and ambitious program. But little attention was given to the monitoring possibilities for the safety of the known toxic treatment. WHO experts took no notice of our concerns, saying that it was essential to make these medicines available and that the countries must make the necessary monitoring of safety available. How is this to be afforded? I attended a meeting in South Africa soon after the launch, and there were several reports of deaths from lactic acidosis, which is an upset of the chemistry in the body and rather rare, except in diabetics. It 
was noted that these early South African cases were on women. The medicines concerned were part of the uh, very highly actually the and anti-retroviral treatment. And there were two main suspected medicines causing lactobacillosis. The problem had rarely been seen in the US and Europe, where the early experience of these medicines was largely in males. And they thought that lactic acidosis was a rare problem with no serious significance. We still don't know why it is that African women are more disposed to have lactic acidosis. But we do know that the reason that they die is at least in, in part due to that those rural areas may not have access to early diagnosis, which is clinically quite difficult and needs confirmation by laboratory tests. Now, we know that 80 to 90 percent of, case, of cases of lactic acidosis only occur in women in Africa and who are mostly overweight. And that the mortality in this group is 15 percent. Half the people who get it die. This example is typical of where a group of vulnerable outliers do not have enough attention to their plight. In this case, to find out how to prevent it. They're excluded. Some of the disadvantages are neglected because normal society tends to say it's their fault. I've spent considerable time with drug addicts and their rehabilitation. Many of them not being able to cope with some of the nastiness of normal society and start taking drugs as a refuge when they could find no other. Once they've made that one mistake, the drugs take over. It's no longer their fault that they cannot stop. My fourth message is that many disadvantaged people need recognition, empathy, and help, not blame. Societies all around the world base decisions on epidemiological data. It is not just in medicine, but in advertising, economics, planning, politics. The majority norm in all such studies biases our views of the world because the epidemiological science only concentrates on the norm, not the unfortunate outliers. This leaves us unprepared for unusual situations. The philosopher David Hume said, no amount, uh, no amount of observation of white students can allow inference that all swans are white. But the observation of a single black swan is sufficient to refute that conclusion of all swans. More sarcastically, in the book called The Black Swan, the impact of the highly improbable by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. The author, who's an economist and philosopher, says, if you hear prominent economist using the word equilibrium or normal, normal distribution, do not argue with him, just ignore him, or try to put a rat down his shirt. Frank Zappa, the American musician and philosopher of the 1970s to the 1990s gave us a very important quote. Without deviation from the norm, progress is not possible. Think about it. You as professionals, I think, must be observant at all times for the unusual occurrences. Not only learning from the privileged, but also the disadvantaged, even though from both sides. We try to understand why there are outliers and turn that knowledge to benefit in society. Understanding failures in technology and problems in society, including adverse events, will lead us forward. My fifth message is that we should take more and far more notice of ideas and experiences that are outside the norm. That then raises the question of what or who 
children take notice. I would say, don't trust people who use pompous words to hide the truth. Would you buy a car from a business called Pre-Owned Vehicle Reallocation Consultants? <laughs> Technological advances have been huge and have the potential for immense benefits, but also harms. The degree of benefit versus harm depends on how we use that technology and other scientific advances. In turn, that rests on our full understanding of the nature of all the new stuff and its possible consequences. Since this is impossible, we just can't do it. We rely on the knowledge of technology, knowledge of technologies we made transparently available, and to trust the experts in their evaluation. But we really must consider the context in which technology is used. Societies around the world differ, and so certain maybe individuals do. So we must be critical in our trust in the expert opinions, and not be just relying on followers. Ask questions, get answers, so that it reinforces my opinions. I don't need to tell you that a vast amount of information via the internet. Uh, about that, but it doesn't help us really, because it's not only an overload, but also contains biases, errors, can be misleading, can even be based on fraudulent data, and taken out of context is also ambiguous and confusing. I used to waste a, a lot of time trying to find information in my words. Now I understand it. Look, it's a waste basket of internet. But I don't have to watch it. Just the new things you hear or read without being critical has a long term effect. To put time away, you have to develop your opinions on the basis of weak evidence. You will have difficulty in interpreting subsequent information that contradicts those opinions, even if this new information is more accurate. Or as a wise engineer, my father-in-law Laura argued, there are two state statements that block progress. The first is, we've never done it that way. The second is, we've always done it this way. My sixth message is to understand that all information we are given is a combination of data and interpretation by somebody. It is vital to be critical about how the data is gathered and about who interprets it. Now I'd like to move on to some big challenges that we all face. Particularly, we need to think about the ethics of providing health care for all. And what happens to all of us as we move from the normal public and healthy uh, category going into one of these sick outlier groups? How do we afford it all? Particularly when healthcare demands more money all the time. The current view is that we need economic growth to continue to make our countries rich. And only then can we be able to for spending on health and work. This creates a paradox. The economic models for success for businesses nearly all include growth. This does not fit easily with the idea of sustainable energy and material resources, since growth requires more of it, obviously. However, the more goods we make, the more we use, and the more waste we which requires energy resources to manage it all safely and cleanly. Naturally, we all want benefits from material things, but right now, in our world, the benefits are to the relatively wealthy in all countries, but mostly Europe's majority. Those second rich people in governments are also those who push economic growth. 
Is that motivation only prompted for those who are already rich? Or is, could it be for taxes to be used by governments? The poor must dredge. Yes, thank you. The poor must dredge the residue of waste. Do they get a fair share from taxes? To make matters worse, there is global, rapid human uh, population growth. Even more individuals who want their share of life's offerings. So is the economic growth model really terrible? We're not able to consider it properly because we're told all the time that there are technological solutions to all our ecological problems. But they also require energy resources and or have other problems such as the way in which they influence society and behavior. The most uh, obvious of those being the internet again. Another example could be the greater burden put on healthcare by leading lives with too little exercise to keep fit, as well as the stress from keeping up with the changing world. Once agree, again, I agree with Tyler from the Black Swan, who is worth reading as a book. Discussing economic growth without concern for fragility is like studying construction without thinking of collapses. Think like an engineer, not an economist. And I suspect we have another economic, uh, global economic collapse on our doorstep. But we all want televisions, mobile phones, air conditioning, computers, and so many other materials. The desire for such material comforts is very strong, promoted by continuous advertising and other ways to convince us that we really need material things to lead a happy and fulfilled life. One way is to reduce the amount of money that goes into the profits for rich people by taxation to provide education and healthcare and other necessities. And it's perhaps not by accident that I've uh, gone to live in Sweden, which has the, the world's highest personal taxation. It's produced with the, the goal of equality to a very high degree. But the difference in size currently between the fairly rich and poor income earners is no more than fourfold which I think is quite extraordinary in most people, it's 40 fold. We do have a few real outliers of very rich people, but they're not silent. We're talking about silent. The seventh message is do we really need this when we look at any material group? Better to want what you have than to have what you want. That seems to be one way of getting a society that's both equitable and also preserves our world. But the other possibility is to limit population growth. There's a website, it's called Overpopulation Awareness or .org. It has this to say, and I'm only going to quote it part. Overpopulation is a major cause of the world's economic problems. Whether it is a question of food shortage, lack of drinking water, or energy sources, shortages, every country in the world is affected by it, or will be. Partly thanks to the import of goods from abroad, any particular country is able to maintain its own welfare. This cannot go on in an unlimited way. In fact, the number of inhabitants is rising in every country. The world's population is threatening to rise 
the better to make decades to eight or ten million. Our planet can offer a quality of life comparable to, comparable to that enjoyed in the European Union to no more than two million people. With a population of eight to ten million, welfare per person would, on a world scale will drop to that of a poor farmer who can scarcely provide sufficient food for himself and knows nothing of welfare. And thus, we will have to share everything fairly in order to avoid disputes and war. There will come a time when population growth and welfare collide. There is a reasonably good chance that floods of people will trek all over the world searching for more food and welfare. That's no longer a prediction. That's happening, as you know. The only solution is a population policy applied on a worldwide scale. Unfortunately, too often, any discussion of overpopulation or of population policies is taboo. The business world and the religions are generally only interested in population growth. In addition, the growth scenario continues to dominate worldwide thinking about the solutions for problems set out here. That's the end of the quote. But these global issues affect us and our families very seriously now and in the future. We have to consider them. The population growth is a delicate issue. It digs deep into our personal lives and certainly we can ask, why should I? or we make such a sacrifice when the rich in rich countries do nothing. The eighth message I want to emphasize here is that if we do nothing about population growth, there will be huge inequalities between the rich and the poor, poor education, poor health care, and welfare, lack of food, clean water, leading to strife and war. According to Adam's Ulanabal Milova Kelly and several other authors, there are ten main issues to be considered in Nigeria. I would say that it applies to most countries around the world. They are ineffective in leadership and corruption, over reliance on work, inflation, unemployment, government policy, monetary policy, adequate infrastructure, power supply, inadequate health facilities. These come up with issues in every country. Can we suggest some ways forward, from which I have selected that federal government should come up with a formidable economic policy? Nigeria has to concentrate on the production of goods, which it has absolute advantage. All security agencies should work together to better and secure Nigeria. Corruption should be eliminated. Corruption can be put in place. Yeah, health facilities, a healthy Nigeria will be a wealthier Nigeria. For those who access health care, it's expensive. According to the World Bank, roughly 750 out of every 1,000 naira is spent on health. In Nigeria, that 750 comes from Nigerian citizens. Compare this to smaller economies in poorer African countries like Kenya, Ghana, Tanzania, Africa, and Sweden, uh, where citizens spend roughly 250,000 In Sweden, the maximum fee I'm charged for an operation or a visit to the consultant physician is 300 Swedish dollars. Especially for those with an extra naira to spend, these extra costs mean oftentimes people either won't seek treatment in the avenues or are forced to sell belongings or forego other essentials like food and feeding to cycle of poverty. The ninth message is taken from care. Citizens must again tell their governments. 
Now, final section, I must say something about this that distinguished the rest of the early century. The philosopher Aristotle used the Greek word phronesis, which translates to a variety of things. It's really intended to be wisdom, to be the practical reason for the common good. That is really very effectively restated in the University of Medellin's Crest, which contains these wonderful words, as you all know, knowledge as a service. So the University of Medellin clearly supports Aristotle. The high academic achievement needs to be linked with doing something in society. Not only in this country, but elsewhere in the world partly through producing graduates with the highest ethical standards and knowledge. I gather that the University of Benin has the best medical school in Nigeria. So this poor argument between us, we won't have a sleep. But I would make the plea that in healthcare education, Apart from learning the traditional things about diseases and what happens in resource limited countries, including Nigeria, must be to train to the highest level professionals to work in the field of medicine and to protect its future generations from added burden of fraudulent and suboptimal sub treatments. Medication errors. Little, I think can be more disheartening for a patient than to be offered a treatment for a disease and then find that the medication itself causes another disease. It's also a waste of precious healthcare funding. The special needs of individuals in the population of Nigeria and Africa as a whole, as a whole calls for this focus I've mentioned couple of examples where there are issues that I've come across in that respect. The diverse, diverse, sorry, the diverse genetic background of people in Nigeria and elsewhere will need this focus. It's not only that uh, uh, for, the for the management of the medicine for ordinary diseases that are tested in the West, there's also the issue of uh, diseases that are peculiar to the continent of Africa, for which now there are uh, increasing numbers of medicines. But of course they're not tested in the same way in a European and US population. As of this date, to my knowledge, there is no university in Nigeria training postgraduate students in the field of pharmacology. But I am delighted that the University of Berlin has already initiated steps with the support of the UNC and other partners. I do hope that this will see the first and fourth postgraduate training from in pharmacology. <coughs> Global funding of education is increasing. However, the need is more important and urgent in resource and limited countries where there are the competing demands for, for all other things to, to be done. While the rich countries in the West continue to spend more resources, the converse is the case in those that are Value for higher education must be supported by government and attracted from local and international stakeholder partners. Sustainability of funding for the education sector across various sub subject areas, including this is an investment for the future which will provide and protect future generations in all relevant. The tenth message 
is that there is a need for research to better understand the African population and its response to this. This cannot be found by looking at norms from other countries. Some last thoughts. It's the responsibility of all of us who are privileged to ensure that those aren't, who aren't, have the best chance of a better life. This includes balancing the needs of individuals with those of the part of society who have failed, no less than no belief. Are two words that I always remember about We should aim to create loving societies through our individual actions. Fairly choice. Love conquers all things. We too shall yield to love. Benin, to 
share this moment with us as we celebrate the 45th convocation ceremony of the university. I would like to thank you also for treating a very difficult subject and treating it so well, making it plain for all of us, irrespective of our training and our background, to follow you and to share the ideas that you have shared with us. I think for me, one of the things that I live with today it doesn't matter what your profession is. It doesn't matter whether you're an engineer or a sociologist. What is important is that you make a difference in the field that you've been called to serve. Many times in this country, when we see problems and difficulties, we throw our hands up in the air and say there's nothing we can do. Well, Professor Edwards has shared with us today that there is something that each one of us can do to make a difference in society. And because, because, all of us here belong to the universe, not only in this country, but in the world. Let's go out and make a difference in that profession where you are. And I'm happy also that the University of Benin is going to be the first university to offer training in pharmacology. Vigilance. And I'm sure many other universities will follow your footsteps. So, Mr. Vice Chancellor, I want to say thank you for taking that ball step. And I want to say that the incoming Vice Chancellor, Professor Lilian Salami, they are going to step into a big shoe. And you cannot afford to fail us as a university. By the time they celebrate their final year or their final hours in university as a vice chancellor, my prayer is that we hear good news that we built on the foundation. <laughs> Finally, Rob, thank you for coming, and we wish you well. We hope you will spend the whole week and share the week of us so that you can see what the universe is all about. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, just, just before I invite the, the Chairman of Ceremonial Committee for the World of Thanks, just to inform you that uh, some of us. And in the dates, directors, some of us are invited for the brief cocktail at the Coach Chancellor's Lodge. I'm sure we'll be giving a ticket. For the dates and directors, please just move down the others. It's not for everybody. Students, go back and write your afternoon paper. <laughs> they are not invited. Okay, and um, just uh, Chairman, sir, you did say that, uh, that the Vice Chancellor designates that you're going to uh, have the very big shoes to fill. When you mention it, I look at our shoes. And that, I'm about that size 46, I mean. Those are very big shoes. Thank you, man. <laughs> Professor Ogil Sadolo, please, Chairman of the Ceremonial Committee, to be good of thanks. Chairman of the Council of the University of Council of Asia President, 
members of students of the University of Benin, professors, staff, and students, first, let us rise to specially appreciate and thank our confession lecturer with a very large applause. We thank you for you will all agree with me that we are touched, all of us as individuals, touching us by leading us to give our best and to our best society. We thank you so much for coming. Um, when he was invited as the top official lecturer for this year, there were a lot of challenges. Professor Issa, of course, you know much about that. But today, we're happy and we thank God that he's here with us. Thank you so much for accepting the invitation of the University of the Day to be here today. Thank you. Well done. Our Vice Chancellor and his management team for the support that has been given to us, the ceremonial committee to put this together. This is a thank you so much. The Deputy Vice Chancellor, Registrar, Bossa de la Guerrilla, we thank you so much. We want to thank especially today the Chairman of Council and who is the Chairman of this convocation lecture. We thank you for your vision. We thank you for your guidance. And we thank you for your fatherly role in this request. We heard your remarks about the lecture and the lecture. And we hope that all of us will be challenged by it to keep our best and do our best for the University of Benin. I want to thank all council members here present. I want to thank all staff and students for your time. We also want to thank members of the ceremonial committee. Um, it's not been easy to work without funds. Many of us, we have had to go and borrow money from outside to be able to do what we are doing now. Because the postal department has not released money to us. Members of the ceremonial committee, individually, we have had to do what we are doing now to ensure that this last completion ceremony of the Vice Chancellor will not fail. All of my people, thank you so much for your cooperation. Thank you so much for our assistance. We are just starting. After this convocation lecture, please, all members of the Cerebral Committee will return to the professional touch, but we will come back here to start with the game in preparation for tomorrow's uh, uh, important activity that is the event in which uh, prizes, diplomas, certificates, and degrees will be awarded by. We are working tomorrow. So please, all members of the ceremonial committee, after the cocktail, we must return back here to begin work. I'm sure the budget department will begin to do some things for us at that time, if the money or the cash is available. So for everyone who has come, thank you so much for being here. We hope that they will raise more money to us so that we can make one of this of this available to all members of the university community. Thank you so much and God bless you all. Thank you very much, the ceremonial committee chairman, for thanking us and for getting to thank you, sir. May I quickly inform him that uh, the boss rate is not refused to give them money. We've been having some issues with our own remedy, uh, but may I announce to him that those things and gradually make something. And the ceremonial committee, with the commitment of the university to 
responded to accordingly. Thank you very much for your understanding. May I invite the PC designate, other principal officers of the university, to please join the chairman and the vice chancellor up here for the photograph. Thereafter, members of council, please join them. Then we shall take the closing formalities. Immediately after the answer, the provost, the and directors, the pro chancellor and chairman of council will be hosting all of you. All that are supposed to be there. May we please, all the American professors, and then those of you will also be there. At the next standing off stage, we are going to take the universe anthem and then. The second stanza of the national committee members, please come up stage after the anthem. The universe anthem.